Okay, well, it looks like we have a good group here. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone to the Kelty Mental Health Resource Center's webinar, Youth Inspiring Action for Mental Health, a Video Toolkit Premiere. My name is Michelle Chanfrone, and I'm a program manager with the Health Promotion and Health Literacy team at BC Children's Hospital. I want to start by respectfully acknowledging that we are coming together today from many traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories. BC Children's Hospital and the Kelty Mental Health Resource Centre are located on the land of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations. And we are honoured to be able to, to do our work on this land, supporting children, youth, and families, and we're committed to meaningful reconciliation and decolonization. Um, so a bit about our team before we get started. So the Health Promotion Health Literacy Team at BC Children's Hospital support works to enhance the mental health and well-being of BC's children, youth, and families. And our team offers a variety of ser free services and supports specifically for school communities. And we offer support um, with mental health promotion planning and implementation. We offer resources and support to parents and caregivers to the Kelty Mental Health Resource Center available at keltymentalhealth.ca. We also offer support for school counselors and other clinicians who are providing mental health and substance use care to children and youth through the Compass Mental Health Program at compassbc.ca. And we also work uh, in close collaboration with our partners at Foundry on the foundrybc.ca website, which offers information, resources, supports and services for youth and young adults in BC. And we'll, we'll add that link to the Foundry website in the chat. So our, our school mental health promotion team, the team that's bringing, bringing you this webinar premiere, uh, works, we work collaboratively to support schools in promoting mental, the mental health and well-being of their students. And we do this by providing mentorship, resources, professional learning opportunities, such as, such as this webinar series. Um, and this webinar series is part of an ongoing series of webinars for BC school communities, and it is generously supported by the Connects for Kids Fund. So a few housekeeping items um, before I introduce our speaker. So you've, you've all been automatically muted and cameras are turned off. So feel free to sit back and relax and enjoy the show. Um, if you have questions, um, you, can, you can enter those in the chat and that will go to our meeting hosts only. And just a, a note that we have a wonderful team working behind the scenes to help make this webinar possible. So a big thank you to Amy, Catherine, Mari and Bryn for helping to support on the back end. Um, at the end of the webinar, you'll see a survey link pop up and we encourage you to please complete that survey. Um, and finally, a PDF of the slides as well as a recording of this webinar will be available after the webinar at keltymentalhealth.ca backslash school dash professionals. So I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker, my colleague, Sabrina Khan. She is a health promotion specialist who works with our youth and young adult mental health uh, portfolio with the health promotion and health literacy team at BC Children's Hospital. She led the development of the balancingourminds.ca toolkit alongside youth from across BC who are on the advisory committee and who are featured in the videos. And so I will hand it over to Sabrina to talk about the Balancing Our Minds Toolkit. Thanks so much, Michelle. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm so grateful to be sharing a little bit more about the Balancing Our Minds Toolkit with you today. Um, so the Balancing Our Minds initiative consisted of events which were aimed at reducing stigma and raising awareness about mental health in schools. And initially, these were held at Rogers Arena, which then progressed into community-led youth summits that took place in school communities across BC. And over the nine years of the Balancing Our Minds initiative, over 10,000 students were reached across BC. Um, and as a culmination of the Balancing Our Minds initiative, we co-created a virtual video-based toolkit on mental health advocacy for youth by youth. And the purpose of this toolkit is to really empower young people and students to inspire action and create change wherever they're at in big ways and small ways. And for our adult supporters in the room, we hope this will further inspire your allyship with youth and their engagement in their schools and communities. 
Um, so this would not have been possible without our wonderful Youth Advisory Committee who co-created the toolkit alongside our team and were instrument instrumental in making key decisions such as the focus on uh, mental health advocacy, the toolkit themes, and the look and feel of the whole thing. Um, so I wanted to give a big shout out and thank you to Noya, Chetan, Mira, Owen, Bule, Irvin, and Rihanna, who are the real superstars behind the scenes and helped the toolkit be what it is today. Um, and I also wanted to share just two, um, two of the notes um, from them on why they think the toolkit and videos are important. Um, so one of them said, I hope that people will be inspired. I want people to see this toolkit as a stepping stone to do greater things and help bring about more change. And another committee member said, if they, the youth, have this toolkit to guide them in their advocacy, hopefully the idea of stepping out of their comfort zones and beginning to advocate in their community won't seem quite so daunting. So thank you again to our amazing youth advisory committee, some of which who have joined us for the webinar today. Um, and now I'm pleased to introduce the young people that you're going to be hearing from in the videos today and who joined us at the end for a bit of a discussion. Um, so in the videos, we're going to be hearing from these six amazing individuals from across the province on how they inspired action and created change in their own school and their communities. Um, so we're going to be hearing from Jay, Ojis, Lori, Catherine, Noya, and Boule. And so without further ado, I'd love for us to start the premiere with our first video. So please sit back and grab, grab a snack and, and enjoy. Um, so in the first video that we're going to be seeing, um, it's, it's called How to Start Advocating for Change for Mental Wellbeing. And we're going to hear from all six young people on how to take that first step to get started. Advocating, such a big word. Once you start breaking it down, it's just being human. Being human is being able to see that you are able to help others. Yeah, advocacy is definitely an intimidating thing. You're like, I can't make that big of a change. Like, I want to make a difference, but how? And it literally just starts by wanting to make that change and telling people that you want to make that change. You can start advocating for mental health by just taking a small step of just having a conversation with someone and ask how they're doing. You can talk to your friends, family members, co-workers, and just listen to the, how they're doing. If things are happening where like there are mental health initiatives already in your school, just being part of them is okay too. I think a lot of people don't realize that that's part of it too. If you see that there's a thing called Wellness Wednesdays at lunch, you could tell your friends like, oh wait, let's come, let's go to this thing, sharing it with other people. Another really great opportunity to start advocacy is to find groups in your community that are looking for people with a specific lived experience. So there's a lot of healthcare organizations that are looking for youth in high school who have challenges with depression, anxiety, even things like diabetes all of these really important topics. They're looking for people who have experience that are younger because the adults who are making decisions in the healthcare system have no idea what it's like to be in high school. Talking to your counselor would be a great start for anyone who is interested in mental health and wants to do something about it. Sometimes finding an adult ally can be really difficult. Uh, for me, I personally go with my gut and kind of test the waters and once you know they're a safe person, being able to approach them with the information or even just the question of, hey, I'm interested in advocating for this, how would I go about it? A lot of the time, if you found the right adult ally, they're willing to provide you with information or push you towards the, a person who would be able to. I think another great thing is to like start groups where people can feel free to just talk about their mental health. Just sit there and just talk about what's going on and how they're feeling. And even though like we're not therapists or anything like that, no, but like people need connection and people need to be together. So just being around each other and being able to hear other people's stories 
and just feeling like there's people there who are there for you and wanting to listen to you can be like really helpful. It's also important to know your own boundaries because you can't be advocating 24 seven. It becomes exhausting. You need to know when you need to step back. That way, when you are advocating, you can put your 100% out there and you can give the best information possible. To everyone who wants to get into advocating for mental well-being and mental health, I would recommend them to start taking care of themselves first, put them first, put self-care first. Going out for a hike and taking pictures really helped me de-stress, which in turn helped me help out more people. And personally for me, a lot of my coping mechanisms come from artistic things such as drawing, filmmaking, listening to music, uh, creating music. And I find that working with a lot of the people that I do, music is a huge part of being able to cope. Writing is also a big one, being able to journal. Yeah, I think that's the cool thing about advocating for mental health. Like, there's so many ways you can do it and to incorporate your own interests and your passions because that's what um, connects us at the end of the day. Don't be afraid to start small and build from there. So long as you educate yourself and you have all the information to back yourself up and you're able to reach out to a staff member or a teacher to be your sponsor teacher and you're willing to push for it, Anything is basically possible. You just have to have the will and the drive and the passion. And from there, things only begin to build. And just try not to get too down on yourself because it is a process and it will take time, but anything's possible so long as you try. Amazing. Um, so in the next video that we're going to be seeing, um, there's five total videos. Uh, so in the second video on how to create a safe space, we're going to hear from Noya and Ojis on the importance of creating a safe space and how you can take steps to make spaces safe for yourselves and others. Being able to just meet like-minded people and be in a safe space where your interests and your personality won't be judged is such an important thing. Going to school can sometimes either be a person's safe place or a war zone for them. And being able to remove some of the barriers at school can really help, I think, with mental health. I was bullied a lot in elementary school, so school wasn't a safe place, and sometimes home wasn't a safe place either. And over time, I learned that it was the same for other students. And I was like, well, why can't we create a safe space for students and staff? High school is a hard time for like a lot of teenagers. A safe space where they can just calm down and talk to people is really important. When I came from India about four years ago, I didn't speak English fluently and always had a problem communicating with others. The worst part uh, for me during school days was lunchtime because everyone was with their friends having fun and stuff. And I was just sitting alone at the corner table. One day I just saw some other kid in my school who was sitting alone. I just decided to say hello to him. And we just talked about how we felt judged by others for sitting alone at lunchtime. And that's where I got the idea to start a lunch club where people can just come in and talk to us about whatever they like or just keep them themselves and spare them the feeling of feeling judged by others for sitting alone. When it comes to creating a safe space to empower youth, one of the biggest things is knowing your audience. Once you know what your audience is, you're able to present the information and resources for them. Me and my friend decided to push our um, comfort zones and then we just like talked to people who we saw sitting alone and invited them to hang out with us. By the end of the year we had about 15-ish people in our group. Being able to have that connection with your peers really helps you you know educate them and let yourself be educated by them. 
Everyone requires a different safe space. Everything it will make a different person feel safe. So for example, at our school we have two clubs, a diversity club, which encompasses all forms of representation of diversity within our school, and it works towards making our school a more inclusive space. And we have GSA, which stands for Gender and Sexuality Alliance, and they work towards providing representation for LGBTQ+, like primarily, as their focus. I'm a leader on the Diversity Club, and GSA I'm an active member of, and hopefully a future leader. It's really nice to see everyone come in and share their perspectives, and work towards um, advocating for different things, or making our school as a whole more inclusive. A lot of people in my in my club right now are currently like not full English speakers, like their first language. And then they really appreciated that, that they can just come into a space, a non-judging space where they can even talk to in, in their own languages to people who speak that language and just not be judged by others. In my film class, a lot of the directors we originally were studying were white cis men. And I have been trying to make the push for us to be able to study different directors or movies that are BIPOC or LGBTQ+, so then people can have that representation not only on screen, but behind screen. Something else that I've done is I created a French pronoun poster. Uh, as someone who doesn't fall into the gender binary, it's really hard being in a French class and deciding what pronouns do I use? How do I conjugate the different like verbs and words to fit my identity? I've had people that have come up to me and had said thank you because they now have a pronoun that they can use when in French class. Uh, I feel good about making a safe space for me and my peers in my school. Uh, this really helped my mental well-being as well as my peers. Uh, I made a lot of new friends and making this group and having a safe space for people to just come and chill out with uh, really helped a lot of people in my school. Having GSA and diversity, it's really been great because you have teachers who are like willing to make a pathway for you that you then go down to help other students like you and create a safe space where Pronouns are respected, everyone has access to bathrooms, there's different learning styles um, and teaching styles, and teachers do different things to make things more accessible for other students, which I think is extremely lovely to be able to experience. Um, thank, that was great. Um, so in our next video, um, it's going to be how to inspire change through storytelling. And in this video, Lori is going to speak about how sharing her story empowered her to inspire action and create change. And Noy is going to share the impact of sharing our stories for others. Enjoy. How to inspire change for mental well-being through storytelling is to use everything that you've gone through and that has been such a struggle and a journey for good. And it's as simple as just being honest about who you are and what your experience has been. And that one interaction, even if it's just with one individual, can change everything. As an Indigenous person, everything that I've learned has been through storytelling, since that's a fundamental part of our culture. And with that skill, I've learned how to take my experiences with mental health and be able to share those with other people. I have really struggled with mental health issues since I was a young child. When I was 18, I was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. At first, it's so scary to see all of these uh, really negative things about the mental illness that you were just diagnosed with. And so that really terrified me because I really wanted to make a change for people like me. And I started right out of high school 
uh, doing some speaking about mental health using my own lived experience with anxiety and depression. And I was speaking to like educators, physicians, and other healthcare providers to try and really shed light on what it looks like to live with a disorder that's really highly stigmatized in the healthcare system. Being able to share your story and your experiences with mental health and a variety of topics shows people that they're not alone and they should know that there are resources out there for them and that there are people like themselves. I ended up starting a podcast called Bold Beautiful Borderline with an individual in the States and we've been doing this podcast together for two years sharing our stories. Every interaction I have where I'm open about my reality is breaking down stigma one person at a time. One of the really unique opportunities that I've had is to be able to work with youth who are in high school and are sharing their story for the first time. So I did this primarily through Balancing Our Minds. Balancing Our Minds is essentially an event series that happened annually pre-COVID and it was really designed to be led by youth and to be focused on youth mental health and wellness. When I was involved in the planning for the Surrey event, one of the things that was really amazing is that we were able to give space and provide opportunities for youth who really hadn't shared their story before to be able to do that for the first time in a place that was really designed to be safe for them to share. A few things that I recommend when you're sharing your story for the first time. Make sure that you're ready. In order to make that kind of positive change and to be able to help others, it can be more helpful to be a little bit further in your recovery journey so that you can provide some really helpful, tangible tips for people who are struggling and they're in the thick of it. So a few things that I always encourage youth to do is write your story down, leave it for a few days, and then come back to it and read it over again. And then see, okay, well, when I was writing it the first time, I felt really comfortable talking about X, Y, Z, but today I'm not really feeling that comfortable about it. If that's the case, you might not feel comfortable the day that you're trying to share your story for the first time. So it's better to err on the side of caution there and kind of leave out some of those pieces that are really traumatic for you to talk about. And sometimes you won't, you won't know that until you start practicing and saying it out loud for the first time. Um, writing and saying things out loud can just come off completely differently. So we wanna make sure that we're honest about our true life and experiences, but are able to focus on how we overcame some of these things rather than focusing on like, the worst part. Self-compassion is incredibly important when you're going to start sharing your story or start doing advocacy work about mental health issues or even physical health issues or disabilities that you may have. Knowing that it's okay to think that you're comfortable sharing your story today and tomorrow you might not be. And a lot of the time that out is actually the most helpful thing because you just like need to know that you could change your mind if you needed to. There are so many stories of growth and they really need to be highlighted. And being able to remove the stigma is such a valuable thing. I think storytelling is such an important form of advocacy because we don't have to feel alone. True, real, raw stories are so incredibly valuable for people who don't have the opportunity to share. And that shared connection over things that we've been taught to hide is life-changing. Um, so we're, we're halfway done here on in terms of our videos. If you have any, any questions, please um, you know, send them to the panelists. Um, in our in our next video, um, how to start a mental health event club or initiative. Um, it's when we think about how to get involved, there are a few ways, such as like through events, clubs, initiatives. In this next video, Catherine, Boule, and Lori are going to share their experience on how they got involved in mental health advocacy. Whenever I'm studying and like doing my homework, I always have my ukulele beside me. And that's kind of like in the moments where I feel so overwhelmed, that's what I reach to. And just playing and 
plucking <laughs> like a couple of chords and stuff, that really did something. And I was like, hmm, you know, maybe that's something I can explore further. I think it's important for youth to take initiative for things because it inspires and it's like, oh, if they can do it, you know, I can do it too. I think it's particularly important for young people to get involved with like mental health initiatives because mental health affects a lot of young people and a lot of them are too afraid to like talk about it. So by getting more like youth involved in different initiatives, it means that more people are gonna have better understanding and it means that we, the youth, can also educate other people based on the information that we've learned. I started Tutor and Tunes as part of a school project because I wanted to explore music for mental health and kind of do some research and how I could apply that and use it to make a difference in my school. Tutor and Tunes is an after school program where uh, students can go to get some homework support from senior students and also kind of explore and be introduced to musical activities that can benefit their wellness. After doing some research with music and mental health, I got to interview and talk to some music therapists. I was like, it'd be really cool if I could try and see what impact music therapy can have on students, because it's not really like something that uh, schools offer. In order to evaluate the effects that the workshops were having, um, I created a survey. People were saying some pretty good stuff like, you know, this is a this is a really nice space. I feel like I could just like forget about school for a little bit, but also like just de-stress and have fun with a good group of people and play music. I first heard about balancing our minds through my psychology teacher. With balancing our minds, the goal was to create a toolkit which would be implemented in like schools. I applied to be on the balancing our minds youth advisory committee. The advisory committee was a group of basically eight youth from like across BC and our goal was to help with the the details of the toolkit if I can put it that way. We are the ones who decided the information that go in, how it was going to be presented and also kind of like why we wanted to like discuss those specific things. I got involved in balancing our minds Surrey and I had started doing some public speaking at that time about mental health issues and so I was asked to be on the planning committee and to be the host of the event and one of the times I shared my story as well. So in terms of how to get involved I think really finding the local clubs in your community or in your school to really say hey I have this experience I'm really passionate about making change for mental health um, for people like me and I'm willing to be involved and start with volunteer work and see if you can just get involved in any cool projects that really speak to you. There's often teachers in schools that will really kind of champion some of this work and connecting with them and just saying like, when something comes up, this is what I'm really interested in, is a really great place to start. I talked to my psychology teacher specifically because I knew that she would be the best person because that's literally what we talk about in her class. So talking to someone who is like, well, like, experience or like is like a trusted person who will like push to help you and like be there for you is like very important. I knew from the start that before I did anything I wanted to educate myself first and do research because once I started looking into it I found that a lot of other people have done things like this before. So I kind of took inspiration from that too. Honestly, the steps that I took to get here, it wasn't that difficult. It wasn't something that I had to write a huge essay for or do a lot of work for. It was just explaining my opinion and just talking from the heart. And I think everyone can do that. So just get out there and look for opportunities. Even if you're not ready to start your own club, there's many ways you can get involved. Most schools have like a wellness club or a counselor which you can talk to and there's a lot of spaces like on social media, there's a lot of people advocating for mental health. Don't be afraid to, to you know, sit in on a meeting, even it might be a little intimidating at first, but it always pays off and there's people out there that 
are feeling the same way as you and you can get inspired by them. And so for our final video on how to start the conversation about mental health, Jay, Boulay, and Noya are going to talk about the importance of having a conversation and how it can impact mental health and well-being for us all. Enjoy. To start the conversation, it takes a lot of heart and it takes a lot of time. That experience when we're able to be vulnerable and take one little minute to just open yourself up just a tiny bit, it makes a big, big difference. Once we start seeing real people around each other and real humans interacting about what they're truly going through, we're able to see such a big difference in how we're able to communicate and how we're able to see each other in real life. The start of conversations, it's a huge piece because it's so uncomfortable. Nobody wants to have those conversations. Nobody wants to like really talk about stuff like that. There was a friend of mine who told me that he had depression and I just said, um, well, I hope you feel better. And I remember going home and feeling really down about it because I know that, that there's a like deeper issue. When it comes to starting the conversation about mental health, any question is a good question. Uh, even if it may be an offensive question, when you ask it, that uh, creates the opportunity for others to educate you and so that you can learn. Also to being able to just educate yourself a little bit and read up a little bit on things and then try and spark a conversation with others. They could either learn things or be able to provide further education uh, for you or resources. So some tips. I can share of how to make those changes, how to start those conversations within the school you're at, it takes a few little crucial steps. That starts with learning to love yourself. And those things can come with self-care. Like in grade eight, I really didn't know who I was. I never really took a minute to just go like, what do I really like and what do I really wanna do that makes me happy? And I found out that I love music and it made me smile a lot and it made me build relationships with others. And so once you start finding these things that you're really, really into, you're able to see that like that's a connection with others and with yourself that you're like, wow, these are things that I enjoy and that I love putting effort into. Let's try to find some other things that I like. After you've learned that first step of just loving yourself a little bit more, the second step is learning how to love another person. Realizing that I'm not the only person on this earth. Like sometimes I'm really thinking and going in my head going like, I have all these things to do. I have like all these people I have to talk to. I have to finish my homework. I have to do all these things. Just know that there is another person thinking the same exact thing. And the least you can do is talk to the other person. Go like, hey, like I'm struggling with my homework. Do you want to study together? Little things when we start to realize how there's other people in our, in our social circles. We're able to have that trust and that support and build that, you know, that bridge where we're able to start talking about many things, especially mental health. That next step is really finding that community. And that community is, for example, for myself, I really found that being with other queer people and having the same struggles and the same experiences we're able to see that we're able to make change together. And that change can be something as little as just something within your own community, or it can be something as big as, you know, changing something within your own province, within your own nation. And so step by step, just take it little, little day by day. Don't think that you're gonna do this just in one day. This takes time. <laughs> so be patient with yourself, be patient with others, and know that you have the support. One thing that I learned in grade eight from one of my teachers actually is when you go into a conversation with someone, never go in to change their opinion, only to share your education. Because when you go in trying to change someone's opinion, it's not going to happen. But if you go in to share knowledge and they'll want, they'll feel accepted and like it's an open conversation, that opens so many doors. 
if I had had the same knowledge I had now and I was ready to make like good use of the knowledge and have a like appropriate conversation, it would have been beneficial in the sense that my friend would have realized that I cared and not only I cared, I understood. Being able to understand and being able to have open, honest conversations and just being there is just extremely important. And when we're starting to talk about mental health, we're starting those conversations, however big it is, it's still a start. It's a step in the right direction. And I think we're getting there, but it does take time and a lot of heart. Um, so those are our uh, Balancing Our Minds Toolkit videos. You can find them all on the balancingourminds.ca website, um, along with complimentary written content and resources and tools. Our team's going to pop the, the um, link in the chat as well. Um, and now I'm very happy to invite our amazing young people that you just saw in the videos uh, to join in us and have their mics and cameras on. So that'll just take a moment for us to sort out in the back end. Thank you. The, the toolkit link is now in the in the chat there. Hi, everyone. Um, so we have Lori, we have Boule here. Um, we have Noya, Jay, uh, and Catherine. Just giving a moment to spotlight everyone. And we have Ojis as well. Hi, everyone. Um, so we have a few questions for, for our young people here. Um, and I'm gonna get started with the first question. Um, so one of the questions that we have for you is, what is your favorite part of being involved in the videos and toolkit development? Noi, I'm gonna ask you first. I square Noi Snesnet, Saleh, Amish, Nihuehim, Nitsa'as. Hello, my name is Noya. I'm Samish Cree Nati. I'm so honored to be here with you all. Um, I'm on the unceded territories of the Kwantlen, Katsi, and Matsqui Semiamu peoples. Um, it's been an honor working with everyone, and I'd have to say my favorite part is getting to work with such a diverse group of people and being able to come from all such different perspectives, uh, but have a like-minded goal in my Sorry for the background noise. I'm still at school here. Um, That's okay. And kind of all of us aiming towards removing those boundaries surrounding mental health for youth and young people. Because, uh, you know, we all come from different perspectives, but we all had that same goal. And it was so great to share the experience with everyone. Thank you so much, Noya. Noya was a part of the Youth Advisory Committee, but also uh, one of the youth in the videos. So Boule will we'll kind of jump to you. Boule was also involved in the Youth Advisory Committee and the uh, one of the youth in the videos. So Boule, what was your favorite part of being involved in the videos and as well as the toolkit development? Um, honestly, like in the video, I mentioned that my psychology teacher like encouraged me to do it. And if I can be 100%, I did not want to be part of the toolkit at all. But when she encouraged me, I like just like applied for it. And then I got um, to be part of it. And I just, it was really amazing. I think that um, it was great to be able to see people from different perspectives coming together to create like something that's going to benefit other people. And um, I don't know, I just felt like i had been really anxious regarding the fact that it was related to mental health. And I was like, am I going to have an opinion that's going to be heard by other people or even valued by other people? But I realized that that, like, my fear, it's gone. Like, it was absolutely the opposite of what I thought. And instead, I got to be part of something that I think is going to impact people in a great way and also show people that you can go from having done, like, nothing regarding, like, advocacy to doing something like this, or even if it's not something like this, just doing things within your school. And I don't know, that was like, I think it's gonna be like in my heart forever. It's the coolest thing I've ever done. And I'm so grateful I was able to do it. Oh, thank you, Boule. Um, and kind of Boule just also touches on kind of we show in the toolkit, but also in the, in the videos is that you know, the young people in the videos have varying experiences. Some have been doing mental health advocacy for years and some like Boule, this was their first kind of foray into it and just kind of how amazing your contribution is. So thank you so much. 
And so what our other question is, um, what do you hope others will do now that they've seen the videos? And I'm gonna go to Jay first for that one. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, I love that. Um, so yeah, my name is Jay, pronouns he, she, they. And what I hope others will do once they've seen this video. Um, <clears throat> I'm hoping a lot of youth see this video, first of all, uh, because I think, you know, this is all about youth, but it's from youth as well. This is like something I think I'm really, really grateful to be a part of. Um, but yeah, I'm really, really hopeful for the youth to see these videos and be inspired to share their story and know that they're not alone because um, when I went through my struggles, I felt like really no one could understand me. No one could ever um, just resonate with what I, what I was going through. But honestly, looking back, a lot of youth were struggling with the same things I was dealing with and I just wasn't open about it. So I hope that this sparks a conversation or just, you know, just it has something like sparked within someone else's heart. But yeah, I'm really hoping for people to be more open to share their story, to share their truth. Thank you. Thanks, Jay. Um, Lori, I'm going to come to you next. What do you hope others will do now that they've seen the videos and the talk? Yeah, thanks so much. Um, I am so excited to see this uh, come together and be released. It just kind of feels full circle for me, having been around since probably the first uh, Balancing Our Minds. And um, yeah, I really hope that you um, see this video and that they're really inspired, um, like everybody else on the panel has said, to share their stories in a safe way um, and to understand that there's so many, uh, so many unique ways to be able to share your story and to take that lived experience that you have um, and do something positive with it. I know for me, it's like, it, this advocacy journey has really helped me realize that all of the struggles that I went through weren't for nothing and that I can um, make the world a better place because of them. Um, and I also just really hope that the adults in the lives of all of the people that are watching this and um, all of the youth that are going to watch this in the future, that the adults in their life support them. Um, and I know that it can be scary, especially for like certain generations, being this open about your mental health is not something that people are um, used to. Uh, but it can make such a big difference for everyone around you. So I hope adults become more supportive as well. Thank you so much, Lori. Um, and Catherine, I'm going to come to you next. What do you hope others will do now that they've seen the videos in the toolkit? Yeah, um, I think just like what Jay and Lori said, um, I hope that the toolkit sparks conversations and just um, more involvement uh, surrounding mental health and also just I feel like especially youth, I hope that they'll resonate with them and that all the messages we're able to share comes through and that it'll just be a very helpful resource in the future. Thank you so much. Um, oh, just, just sent me a few pointers, which I can just share with the group um, that one can some of the favorite things um, that oh, just you know, of being involved of the video in the toolkit was to be able to contribute to a project that has the potential to make a positive impact on the mental well-being of students. And the fact that the toolkit is aimed at creating a safe and supportive environment in schools was especially inspiring to me. The opportunity to bring my own experience and perspectives to the table and to be a part of the creative process was truly rewarding. Overall, it was a fulfilling and enriching experience and I'm proud to have been a part of it. Um, oh, just I couldn't have, have said it better than you, but unfortunately, I hope that does it a little bit that we can share kind of what your thoughts were there. Um, yeah, so th that's all the questions we have. Um, and then I'm just looking here. Do we have any other questions for our youth panel here? Um, we have one question here. What's one thing you would like adults to know after they watch the videos in terms of moving forward and working with children and youth? Um, does anyone have any answers to that one? We can also share your thoughts after um, in our follow-up email as well. Um, something I kind of just want to add, it's not necessarily just for adults, but I feel like it's kind of mainly directed is being aware of your unconscious bias that you have and being mindful that just because you're older than youth doesn't mean that your opinions are more valid. Um, a lot of the time, youth will be invited to sit at tables and their voices aren't actually heard or uplifted. So that's one thing I liked about this um, 
working with this committee is the youth we had our voices uplifted. So if we have more opportunities like that for youth, it's it's really a game changer. You take the words right out of my mouth, Noya. I totally agree. I think a lot of the time adults will say like, oh, you don't understand what it's like, blah, 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 to be an adult. And it's like, that actually doesn't matter. My experience is still valid in the place that I'm in right now. And we need to make sure that we're acknowledging that. Um, and I am an adult now. And like, I don't think it's any more difficult than when I was in high school, to be honest. Like, if anything, it's probably easier. So Thank you, Laurie and Noya. Um, we have one other question from a student, actually. Um, what's it like managing these advocacy groups as well as other personal responsibilities? Um, there's a, it can be really difficult with time management, like even making this meeting today, it was really important to me, but I'm still at school because if I were to bus home, I would have missed it. So it's like trying to find time within it, but it's also like, it's really a big part of my core values and who I am as a person. Um, so it really depends on the individual, but being on like three different youth advisory committees, going to school, working, and then doing other things. Like just yesterday, I was at the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women's and uh, Girls and Two-Spirit March. And that was, it's, it takes a lot out of you, but it's worth it in the end. Thank you, Noya. Catherine, I think you had your hand up. Um, yeah, I was just gonna say like, uh, for me, starting an initiative was kind of like in my head, I thought I had to do it all by myself. But um, one giant thing that I learned was the more help that you ask like right off the bat and being willing to accept help, that's like so helpful. And just to hear from other perspectives and other um, people that are willing to give you advice, I think, um, yeah, just because it's an initiative doesn't mean you have to do it by yourself, I'd say. Thanks so much. And we did just receive a, a comment saying, I just want to say thank you to all the youth who so bravely shared their stories and put themselves out of their, ad, out there to advocate for change for a better world for others. Um, so thank you so much to this group um, and as well as our youth advisory committee. And so just for everyone else, if you want to hear more from our youth um, and kind of get access to the written content, um, complimentary resources, et cetera, um, you can find that on the balancingourminds.ca website, which will pop again in the chat. And I'm just going to pass it over to Michelle to kind of uh, sign us up for today. Thanks so much, Sabrina, um, and and to the youth in the videos. I I've I've seen those videos multiple times, and just every time I watch them, and every time I hear your voices and your wisdom and your experiences and your stories, just left so inspired and impressed and um, thankful to all of you, um, and thankful to Sabrina and the team that. Um, that supported this group and that created such a safe and um, supportive environment uh, for the project itself. So um, I, I'll just uh, end with just a few, few notes about um, other resources and tools that we have available through our, our website, um, through, we have a school professionals page, the keltymentalhealth.ca website um, with additional resources and information for um, people who work in schools and with school communities. You can find that link there. And then I also um, just wanted to mention uh, just like a big thank you to everybody um, for joining. And I know there were a few questions um, that came through on the chat and we didn't quite get a chance to answer them, but we, we our team is working and we will um, you know, be able to hopefully try to follow up on some of those questions. I think um, I also wanna mention we have an email address and feel free to contact us at schoolmentalhealth 
at cw.bc.ca with any additional questions about the toolkit, the resource, how, how it's intended to be used or how it was developed or any other um, supports that we can provide to you and, and to your, your communities. Um, so unless there's anything that I'm missing, I think just some really positive feedback to our panelists uh, in the chat. So again, a huge, huge amount of gratitude and appreciation for, for the words that you've left us all with. You've left us all feeling very inspired at the end of, uh, of the day here and um, are really happy to, to continue to carry your words with us as we move into, into the rest of our evening and the rest of our week. Um, for our participants, a reminder that you'll be asked to complete a survey when you leave, so we encourage you to please fill that out. Um, again, a thank you to everyone who was involved in this project, as well as everybody on our team who was working behind the scenes to make this webinar possible. It's definitely a team effort, so so appreciate all the time and, and energy that worked in uh, went into sharing this with all of you today. Um, and of course, thank you so much to the so many people who tuned in and who joined us for the webinar, um, who watched the videos, and we encourage you to please share, please share them and the toolkit with your with your colleagues and with your friends, with your students. Um, and we wish you all, hope you all have a wonderful, wonderful evening. Take care. <laughs>